Will I be able to see myself at all so I can kind no, of frame? No, it no, 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 okay. no, 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 no. You and I are just talking. That's it. That's the focus. Close the door. Thank you. Everybody, here we go. Five. Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, we've got quite a show today. If you looked at any uh, any of the so-called conventions, you, we, actually, we had two major conventions. We had the Democratic convention and we had the Republican convention. Not necessarily in that order, just switch them around aspect of it. But as you know, in the last show, what we were going to do, we were going to have, if you will, a discussion of both the Democratic and the Republican convention. But guess what? Uh, you know, from the standpoint that uh, the people are not happy yet. They, they, they are divided. You know, then a majority of the folks on both sides of the aisles are saying, hey, we just don't like the candidates. The pros and the cons, both sides. But we are America. It's fair. It's equal. We got. We're voting. We got. We're the public. But guess what? Out of those discussions, uh, all of a sudden, the, the media as a whole said, "Look, we've got to change that format." All of a sudden, they're mentioning a third party. Third party. They mentioned the Green Party to a certain degree, but then they mentioned the Libertarian Party. And in fact, they even interviewed, if you will, the two individuals, i.e., represented both presidents from a presidential candidate and also the vice president aspect of it. They spoke. And boy, I tell you, the media just went wild and said, hey, look, bottom line, and all of a sudden they define the fact, well, hey, how are you going to get these folks involved in the campaign, especially the debate, especially the debate, because that's the next biggie, if you will. And so the whole idea was, oh, whoa, why don't we get this through? What about the Libertarian Party? They're very credible. Hey, gee whiz, they got two people, former governors, if you will. And so guess what? They, become, they come out on the top. So it's just like any election, you know, it's always the top two or the top three, the top four, whatever. So guess what? They're the top three, possibly. Hey, look like they're going to be in the in the debates, and boy, what what a September we're going to have! And guess what? Here in Oregon, what a September we're going to have! We just happen to have the chairperson of the Oregon campaign for Gary Johnson, i.e., the Libertarian Party. Now he is a Libertarian. Wow. This is going to be awesome. So we got him here today, and so we're going to have that discussion. We're going to give a, we're going to give you all an opportunity to meet the campaign in itself through 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 uh, through, through Scott. And uh, then after we've done that, then guess what? Then we'll have that discussion, maybe another week from now, if you will. We may be able to bring Scott back up and bring the other person representing the Democrat and the other person representing the Republican. And we'll guess what we'll do? We'll have a debate. We'll have the first one before September and see who wins this deal here in Oregon. Oregon. Here we are, folks. So guess what? Let's go. We're going to give we're going to give Scott an opportunity for about 30 minutes. And he's just going to talk about uh, his relationship uh, with the campaign. And he's going to talk about his candidate and the people he's representing and the ideals and what it means to Oregon, what it means to Oregon and show you the qualification that, in fact, he's going to meet that criteria. He's going to meet that criteria from the standpoint of making sure that when you see this person, Gary, on that, as a, in, in the debates in September with both the Democratic person and also the uh, Republican person, then guess what? Hey, we're there because we're going to educate you. And he's going to be on it even more often because we're going to have the other two candidates before September. We might get some insight in terms of what they represent and what are some of your concerns. We may even open up the line, but right now we're just going to do this right away. So, Scott, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. May Gee, I introduce man. myself to your audience? You sure may. My Thank name you. Is, first of all, my name is Scott Scrimshaw. <laughs> I live in Hood River, Oregon. Um, I um, would like to present myself first and foremost. It means to be very clear that I am... I talk with the campaign. I am not. Um, I am not Gary Johnson. I am not Bill Weld. So when I speak, if I am in error as to the campaign's official positions on things, you have to remember I came to the campaign. The campaign did not come to me. As many volunteers, that will be the case. Okay. And so I am. I am not. I am not Gary mm -hmm. Johnson. But when I speak, I think I have a grasp of many of the issues that Gary Johnson has spoken about. I have um, some key ideas into understanding how it affects the state of Oregon. And so I'm very willing to speak on multiple fronts. Multiple and you do support him. Oh, absolutely. Well, I just Completely. want to make sure. That's clear. Yes, that. I just think it's really important that I am here... 
I'm Scott Scrimshaw, chairman for the Oregon yeah. Gary Johnson okay. campaign. Okay. Okay. But that I am not <laughs> I'm not Gary Johnson. So I just want to make it very clear. I will address these issues. I will speak as clearly and as capably as I am possible. But in all due respect, I, I, I've got some questions that I want to ask. Please. You. But I, the first question I want to ask you is why do you support him? How did you first? How did you get into? I lived in New Mexico for 16 years, Bruce. Okay, go on. I actually 16 years. I lived in the state of New Mexico. I lived during his um, governor as his tenure as governor. I worked during his tenure of governor. I had my own small business during his Gary tenure. Now, right? Gary Johnson okay. as governor, and then I lived after he was after he, his second term of as governor. I mm -hmm. um, I lived in the same state that I had to live under the policies that he enacted and put into place, and I saw great benefit to my children and. In terms of education with the charter school movement i saw great um exp really great opportunities for small business when he undertook the roads pr the road projects for i-25 i-40 in albuquerque but also just simply from a small businessman's perspective and certainly as a um a, a voting member of the american public yes i yes. really see great merit in the johnson and weld campaign ticket well that's I value. really do that's major value stuff Absolutely. I mean, the policies up in New Mexico, right? I lived underneath them. I wow. saw the benefit of them, and we can speak more in more detail. Sure, 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 sure. Okay, so now you're in Oregon. How long have you been living in Oregon? I've been living. I lived in Oregon in late 19 in the late 1990s. Um, I moved to New Mexico, um, came back to um, Oregon. I moved back here three years ago, and I I love living. I was living is was in the Dallas for a short while, and then I moved to Hood River. I love Hood River. It's got my heartbeat. Wow. And um, maybe it's that wind moving up and down the gorge. Yeah. Well, in fact, in all due respect, uh, he's got his family here with him also, too. Today. We'll just go through this discussion and maybe we'll, we'll just invite them on, you know, behind him. And, and They're let, my best you, fans. I know that. And we'll invite them over and let them let, let you see them. Trust me, this man is family, man. He's hot. I like it. I like it already. He's, he's really a value of Oregon, too. I like, the, I like that. Thank you very much. Well, look, Scott, let's just get right into the race here now. Um, I've written these purposely down just to make sure okay. that we, we get down to the specifics. Get down to the nitty-gritty, shall get we? Down nitty -gritty. I like it, I like it, I like it already. Okay. And you've given me a copy of your notes, so I appreciate yeah, sounds that. Great. So. Sounds great, sounds good. How about National Unity Division? I say, what makes a Johnson <laughs> presidency a unique solution to our SOFO problem? Can I, you that? I appreciate you Can bringing you that, that up. Um, let me, yes, the unique, the soulful problems. We have a great sense of... Um, concern for the division that we're seeing in our nation okay and i'd like to bring attention to gary johnson's experience in the state of new mexico because new mexico is a very diverse state in terms of its demographics its population you have um you have the, a very large um, native population the native mm -hmm. pueblos you have um, a, a very large hispanic population mexican and people coming from the spanish land grants of uh, so spanish ancestry you have people of mexican ancestry and then you have the as i said the native pueblos you have the Anglo community, you have the um, black community, you have the Asian community. So New Mexico. All sorts of Americans. New, right? Yeah, all sorts of Americans. So New Mexico <laughs> me represents this incredible microcosm okay. of diverse opinions and ethnicities. And Governor Johnson really, his, he governed in such a way that pulled the state together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, here he was a Republican um, governor, mm -hmm. um, very popular with the, the Mexican Democratic community, um, the Hispanic community, the, Demo the Mexican community, um, very popular with the, um, the, the Anglos. Pop, popular with the, the, the Pueblos. He understood that there's a unique dynamic that takes place when you have these merging cultures and it gets back to a soulful solution. He really represent, He really understands the significance of the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, getting back to what unifies us as a nation. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's probably a great for me, kind of place for me to... Okay, good, good. Well, let's talk about education has always been an, a major, major issue, right? Between charter school and IE public schools, if you will. But the bottom, but at the end of the day, it's about the education of our kids. Yeah. It's about the progress because they are the future, right? Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Well, let would... me throw this question. Let me throw this out to you. And I'm going to just throw it because I wanted to make sure that maybe it can incorporate some of other issues. National and international education metrics show this agency is failing. Well, that's it. Oh, the Department okay. of Education. You have to bear in mind, by the way, charter schools are actually public schools. That's right. Um, Gary Johnson in New Mexico is looking at the voucher, um, going through forward with vouchers that seem to have hit some obstacles in the state legislature, which okay. is a democratically controlled state legislature at the time. And so um, he saw the, the charter school movement is a really unique way to deal with, to create competition in the public school setting and in the public school environment 
you have different modes of teaching. Some students are more kinesthetic learners. Some students are more auditory learners. And what the charter school movement does, it's really, uh, it's really a fantastic opportunity of merging or uniting parent co-ops teacher um, administrations, um, school administrations, and you create a whole charter school mm -hmm. which focuses on a particular focus of those parents or of those children's needs. It creates a, um, a, a competition to the public school movement, but it doesn't take away public school dollars. Okay. It creates so, and of course, charter schools are very beneficial to uh, minority um, students, to um, disadvantaged communities, mm -hmm. because it's a method of empowering um, students, empowering parents, to create a curriculum, now they have to use state curriculum, but to create an avenue of education that resonates with these particular students. And mm -hmm. my daughter, for example, graduated from the Santa Fe School of the Arts. Mm -hmm. She would, that school didn't exist ex until Gary Johnson came along. Mm -hmm. My children went to Turquoise Trail Elementary School. That did not exist. Monte del Sol, these are public schools that have to meet the state metrics. But um, our uh, and our fun, they're as I said, public schools. But they have parental involvement that changes the dynamic. And so what you I mean, you made the statement here, and I re couldn't agree more. You know, Governor Johnson. It sounds um, sounds radical. He wants to do away with the Department of Education. Okay. Well, the Department of Education has only been around since um, Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. It's not. Um, it's it's a relatively recent. Um, administrative uh, position um, and what I think what we need to remember is that the Department of Education by any standard any metric take the ne the international metrics or take our own state metrics mm -hmm. the Department of Education is already a failing um, cabinet mm -hmm. position mm -hmm. okay. we are failing our students we are failing our families our schools are not um, again I'm not I cannot speak for every single school mm -hmm. but I can say that by and large when you look at our test scores when we look at our reading skills we look at our mathematics and sciences we are not doing as well as many of our international um, competitors. Okay. okay, from a national perspective. What about from a local perspective? Same thing from a In local Oregon, perspective. From a, have, you, have you basically done any research from a standpoint and compared, if you will, uh, the ranking uh, as far as, I, where does New Mexico and where does Oregon rank? You know, I can't speak any directly idea? to where we sit on the rankings. What I, what I focus my attention on is that you have charter schools here in this state that are doing very well. I think SCI is a great example mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. a charter school. I think Trillium is an example in the of Portland charter schools. Metropolitan area, yeah. yeah, in the Portland metropolitan mm -hmm, area. Right, right. I could probably at a later date get you those figures or somebody can look online okay. but I think the reality is is that we're seeing models in Oregon of the charter school movement providing excellent alternative options mm -hmm. really creating um, a sense where parents don't feel like they have to send their student to a public school system to a public school public school 301 or public school 425 mm -hmm. again I'm just making these numbers up as illustration mm -hmm. illustrative but the point being is that I, if my local public school is failing or not re meet, meeting the levels of expectations that I as a parent would like I can enroll my child in a charter school mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is that's options that's opportunity mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of um, competition involved in that so the, the standard public school has to either react to respond to or answer the in, the events or the um, the actions of a charter school so there's a little competition there the charter school has to compete with some of the standards and some of the experiences that students are having in the in the standard public school environment so anything that creates a sense of competition or innovation mm -hmm. that is a Gary Johnson position okay anything that will stimulate innovation in the public school sector, in the education sector, that is a Gary Johnson position. Okay. Well, tell me this, as far as New Mexico is concerned and Oregon, Oregon, the governor is the superintendent for all schools. What about New Mexico? I can't speak to that. At that time, I was just a dad with three kids. Okay. <laughs> I was just a dad running my own business. And so my, um, I reaped the benefits okay. of a Gary Johnson governorship okay. without necessarily being completely aware of how much he was doing for us as a, as a state, as parents. And what I mean, not so much that he is an individual, but the policies and the approaches that he took to governing. Okay. Um, I reaped those benefits. And now having moved to other, lived in other states where we didn't have that, that same philosophy or approach, I am starting to experience some of those differences. Okay, okay. Well, the IRS has always been an issue. Oh, folks. The IRS, sir? The IRS has always been an issue, you know. Whether you Death file, and taxes. If you file, you're fine. If you don't file, you got problems. That's right. Okay. Death and taxes, and people, guaranteed. Sometimes people say, well, gee whiz, they've, they've missed, oh, if, if, if they want the money, they will tell, send me a letter and say, send me this dollar amount, all right? Right. And you get the audit. On the other hand, if I've mistaken and all of a sudden I've sent my taxes in, but no, I had, I basically, I had monies there, but I didn't know. They don't send me a notice and say, hey, by the way, you've, uh, you, you've misappropriated right. funds on your own, right? Correct. And send the money back. 
that, that's been a problem, if you will. The IRS, what is the IRS? What's its position on, on the IRS? The IRS has always been an institution that the American public loves to hate. Right. Um, I think, really, Gary Johnson's asking the right questions. Okay. Gary Johnson, his whole position is to actually abolish the IRS. Oh, really? He wants to completely do away with the IRS. It doesn't mean that he's doing away with taxation. Okay. But he'd like to see a consumption tax or something along the level of a fair tax, a 23% um, consumption tax, which is a way to generate revenue, but it doesn't rely upon a calcified um, administration to handle that. A mm -hmm. calcified agency with um, numerous um, agents, numerous, um, what, how many thousands of pages yeah. is the IRS tax code? Yeah. And so by doing away with the, um, the IRS income tax of that nature, you open up the floodgates for, first of all, that minimizes government in that respect, mm -hmm. but it also... It changes the way business does things. I think there's an important thing here, particularly, you know, a lot of people are conservative folk, you know, and I don't mean conservative in the sense of the social spectrum, but conservative. They want to, you know, they just want to live their lives. They want to take care of their families. They want to do what's important to them. Maybe they want to go to a private school. Maybe they want to be part of a think tank. Maybe they want to go to church. Mm -hmm. um, whatever these avenues are, these are every single one of these things that I just mentioned, church, schools, think tanks, they're all governed by um, policies and restrictions by the IRS and how they can behave and how they can conduct themselves. Mm -hmm. So, for example, churches are really concerned about losing their tax-exempt status. Mm -hmm. Well, if you do away with the IRS, you're doing away with some of the limitations that are placed on think tanks. They're being placed on um, churches, on the way that they can and cannot speak, the type of organizing they can do. And I think that's really important. I think it, it frees us up from... Perhaps, perhaps this thing about Lois Lerner and the IRS, where she, the, the IRS was caught um, singling out um, conservative think tanks, libertarian-oriented think tanks, patriot think tanks, or patriot bloggers and movements. Also, some people for Occupy, of uh, the Occupy uh, movement. Um, so, when you talk about the IRS, yeah. the IRS isn't simply a, an agency that collects revenues. The IRS is an agency which moderates what we can and cannot speak mm -hmm. by virtue of what, what they will take away from us, mm -hmm. what penalties we may incur. For example, if a, if a pastor or if a rabbi were to speak and the IRS feels that that's not adequate, or that's not something they should be speaking on, or they're spending too much time speaking on that subject matter, well then that rabbi or that, um, that pastor loses their tax-exempt status mm -hmm and can no longer speak to those issues. And I think when you talk about issues of inner city, when you talk about issues of um, freedom of speech, these are the, the churches. I mean, think about, think about the black <laughs> church during the civil rights movement. Imagine, based on today's um, IRS code and tax limitations, what could, how, much, how much would Martin Luther King Jr., what would his speech have been, um, had to be stepped down, pulled back, or you know, censored? Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to really, I think, I mean, that's just a small thing, but mm -hmm. it's not just that he wants to do away with the IRS. He really wants to do with the corporate income tax. And that's the big one right there. Mm. You do away with the corporate income tax. And why would a, why would a company want to invest their monies in putting a um, factory in China or in India or Germany when you can put it here in the United States? You're not going to have this, the taxation that this, this, the tax, the tax income the corporate taxed income, which therefore frees up a business to hire people, to put their factory in North Carolina, put their factory here in Portland, because um, why do I want to go outside the United States? I have no taxes here, no corporate mm. income tax on my business endeavors, my manufacturing endeavors. And Johnson, It's a job creator, I like it's that. It's a job like creator. Okay. So Johnson really sees the benefit of that, but he also understands the importance of maintaining revenue. And so by doing away with the IRS, it doesn't mean that revenue, there's not going to be any source of income tax. It's just going to come about by way of a flat tax, a fair uh, a, a consumption tax, which really makes it more equitable across the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if you're making a, a million dollars a year or ten thousand dollars a year. Ten thousand dollars a year, you know, twenty-three percent off of ten thousand dollars versus twenty-three percent off of a million dollars. It's the same. It's it's the same. It's mm -hmm. it's equally applied. Okay, I like the word equal because uh, one of the things that we have here in Oregon right now that's on the ballot is fair share from the corporate community here in Oregon as far as taxes. So that's, that's being discussed now as we speak. Mm -hmm. well, m m some are saying that, um, in fact, they're not paying their fair share. So we're going to be going I think that, that language in itself is loaded because what okay. you mean by fair share, one person sees me driving my beat-up old car and they're envious that I have a car. Mm -hmm. Another person sees another person living in a very, you know, a <laughs> quarter of a million dollar house and that's too much of a house. Another person sees a three million dollar house. And so when you talk about your fair share, I think really when you get down, basing things on a percentage that is applied to all evenly, there is equity in that.
Mm-hmm. Okay, but like like anything else, we got to vet it first, right? You got to vet it. Oh, absolutely, I mean, you got to vet you it look first. At visual, and, hey, you, you know, I think you that you, you know what, Bruce, you brought up a really important point. Mm-hmm. You know, Gary Johnson recognizes that we have been on on autopilot right. per se against mm-hmm. you know Republican versus Democrat. We've been kind of on this autopilot for so long that we really need to take a, we need to pause, reassess reconfigure and then move forward based on that analysis. You know, Gary Johnson is not coming in wanting to be dictator in chief. He's going to have to work with Congress. He cr- completely understands that with his running ma- running mate Bill Weld. He certainly has a capable and qualified um, partner in doing so. And I think that the excitement that I'm feeling is that there's a sage wisdom in wanting to re-examine what we've been doing. Mm-hmm. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm-hmm. But if it is, if it needs to be um, if it needs to be tweaked, touched, or done away with, let's do that. But let's okay. do it from a position of understanding, simply as a, as opposed to being reactionary. Okay. The last point in regards to the IRS, as far as consumption tax, what do you mean by that? Consumption. Share this with the public. Consumption tax is basically, as you purchase items, okay. there is a tax. Anything. anything. And again, it depends on what model you're using. A flat tax could be a little bit different than a consumption tax. So right now, what I want to speak to is not necessarily the modality of how it, what it's going to look like, right. but the the general understanding that it is a tax that is assessed either on the items that you are purchasing Mm -hmm. or um, it's a tax that is assessed basically that it's no longer something that you're paying into the IRS at the end of on April 15th. It's something that's already being collected as you're living your daily life ah. between April 15th and the rest of the, oh, I'm sorry, you have a microphone no on problem. the table. Yeah, that's no right. Good sorry. Good so the point is, is I don't want to necessarily focus on what the modality is. I want to focus on the fact that, he under, that the Johnson campaign understands that this is something that needs to be, compl- we need to approach this completely differently. Okay. And whether or not it's a flat tax, whether or not it's a consumption tax, that's going to be discussed. Okay, okay. Well, well, gee, we got some time here. I got, oh, we got lots uh, of things. How about, to e- talk about economic growth, the sustainability, oh, God, yes. environmental stewardship, and so on, are deep concerns to many people. What makes Johnson different than the rest of the group? Well, I think first and foremost, okay. So here in Oregon, we are very concerned about the environment. So Johnson definitely understands that global warming is taking uh, taking place. He does understand that it is related to human to human activity of um, carbon emissions. He's looking at the science of that now. How we go about dealing with it and addressing this, that problem, for example, global warming. Johnson, I love his approach. If you want SpaceX, Blue Origin, Tesla, Uber, if you want to have an innovative, um, technology driven approach to renewable energy, clean en- energy, sustainable energy, Gary Johnson's your guy. Why? B- because he understands tried and true conservation practices when you look at his re- under the the north this the, the um, south the western governors associations you see he's always been in step with the practices of conservation but he has an understanding of where the future is he understands that solar he understands the idea of uber where you're cutting out the middleman he understands when you t- let's just take um tesla for example and i'm not saying that um gary mm-hmm. johnson is a big Tesla guy. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that Tesla can represent a model that I, that I, Scott Scrimshaw, mm-hmm. recognize is very significant. Mm-hmm. Tesla not only wants to re- manufacture um, electric cars, he wants to. Um, he wants. He is ma- Tesla or um, Elon Musk is wanting to um, j- create battery storage cap- mm-hmm, facilities. Mm-hmm. That's what's taking place in Nevada. So now, and then he's also looking at, at, at capturing solar energy. That's another avenue of, of Elon Musk and of his activities. So now what you have on a sustainability level, not only are you capturing energy from with solar panels, you're storing energy in battery or in energy storage capaci- okay. Uh, okay. capacities, okay. and now you can sell that energy out to the regular market. And we're all trying to find you can use that yeah. energy, but and then now you can fill you can fuel your car, your Tesla Roadster, your Tesla, um, you know, coupe, based on energy that is completely non-fossil fuel related. Interesting, interesting. Do me a favor. I've got about another eight minutes. I want to make sure I get. We're going to have you on again too. Okay. But I Let's got talk about the civil rights. Let's talk well, about bill of, maybe the, 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 the bill of rights constitution. Or go okay, for well, it. Well, like I said, I'm going to have you on. I want to make sure that we, we really get into some other deals here. Uh, libertarians are viewed as isolationists, soft on military, and misguided on terrorism and aggressor nations. How accurate is that? Get about four minutes on that. 
libertarians are, Johnson Weld are not isolationists. Okay. They are non-interventionist. Okay. Uh, I will translate, translate that Wait, into, please. let's be very honest here. We've been at war for 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. We have, it's time to reassess. If we're going to continue in war, then we need to have a declaration of war by Congress. That's right. what our Constitution dictates. That's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so they are not um, isolationist. They're non-interventionist. Mm -hmm. um, what was the other, what was something else that you asked me along those well, lines? I, you know, this guy on terrorism. How about terrorism? They are, oh, I, I love Johnson and Weld, particularly Bill Weld. You know, Bill Weld worked in the Reagan Justice Department prosecuting organized crime, mm. banking corruption, okay. things like that. So what that tell and so what Johnson Weld, first of all, they're very clear. They understand that we have a threat there is a threat of terrorism. There is the threat of aggressor nations. Now in the incidents of Islamic State driven terrorism, yes. they want to Weld particular with his background wants to pursue that like you would organize crime. Let's go after the funding, let's go after the money, let's go in after the, the banking, the the um, the laundering of money, the the, the you know the put, put it over here so you don't notice it. You hide it behind this shell or you hide it behind this account. And so by process, and, and he is relating that to ISIS. I mean, that's oh, absolutely, here ISIS can't exist without money. Uh, right. So why is okay. for example, we're not the only ones interested in oil in the Middle East. Okay, okay the, these militant. Um, Terrorists are also interested in selling that oil mm -hmm. to fund, to capitalize, their, to produce capital for their jihadist efforts. Mm -hmm. And so when you go after the, um, the terrorist issue based not simply on dropping bombs, in fact, it, the dropping bombs has not done what we would have hoped it to do. Mm -hmm. We've killed innocents, we've been blowing up things, <laughs> sending troops on the ground, and it's time to look at not, I'm not simply stating do away with X so we can do Y. I'm saying we need to look at why and really move on why, mm -hmm. because why has a proven track record, mm -hmm. especially with Bill Weld mm -hmm. prosecuting organized crime. I mean, mm -hmm. let's get real. That's that's significant. You deny the funding, you deny the money, yeah. you can't do what okay. you want to do. I know that this is another issue that I wanted to make sure I want to throw that one in too, because it's major right now. The whole issue of race relations. You know, when you think about that, you think about police, you think about, you know, Black Lives Matter, you think about this, you think about that. Then there's a division between the South of whites and black. It's as if to say we're we're kind of like in a, a revolutionary kind of a mindset. We are like in a we, revolutionary like we kind of mindset. Before, right? But everybody's at the table. Yeah. And over the, at the end of the day, we're still Americans, right? We are we, still we, Americans. We don't need another civil war, right? No, and again, that gets back to your first question. No, we don't. Well, it gets back to your first question. You know, why is Gary Johnson the appropriate Go governor soon to be right, president right. because he has experience working with different people groups but also his back he's a constitutionalist mm -hmm. he understands the bill of rights you know the aclu in his 2012 um, campaign gave him 21 out of 24 aclu liberty torches he understands the importance we need to get back to our founding charter our founding documents which means we are all this is the american experience it's not the american black experience not the american white experience now how that's played out in our different communities right. definitely has had a different experience for these different groups but he wants to bring it back to the constitution back to the bill of rights and i think that puts us all at an equal footing at right, the same table right, right, right. and so there is a revolution going on and we need to rediscover what our revolution was about sounds great well on that particular note like i say i, I want to have you back here again effectively there's this uh, piece about the idea of getting him into the debates coming in september it's uh, happening talk a little bit about that in terms of it is what, happening what, what gives them the opportunity to be able to do that and what's the, what, what are you saying to the voting public out there? Voting be, public, first be, of all, let's talk for? about this. Real I want the voting life. public to be very aware that step by step, increment by increment, this campaign has been growing. Okay. And that means there's substance behind it. You don't come from a minority party status and start seeing the numbers that we're seeing. And I don't, don't mean just simply the numbers, mm -hmm. but the continued consistent growth. Mm -hmm. That means there's movement behind it. And what we are seeing, what the campaign is seeing, and what we, are, what we meaning the American citizens, right, are right. seeing is that this campaign has been growing growing exponentially and it's on the cusp really of growing virally okay and when that happens it's gonna surface mm -hmm. and up until now it's been a lot of talk of Bernie Sanders which my heart breaks when I think right. about right. what the Bernie Sanders folks experienced because that's just you, Sanders should have been treated impartially mm -hmm. by the DNC and he was not mm -hmm. and as a person who is not treated with fairness or objectivity I think that's that just breaks my heart for him to and also his followers but, so how do you guys get to the table? I mean, well, we first of all, we are growing leaps and bounds. Um, we are at 13% on multiple polls now. Okay. So we're two percentage points away, but really... Two percent point meaning that it takes 15% to get... At the table? Is Excuse me. Saying? It takes fifteen percent, but let's let's be honest. It doesn't okay. just take fifteen percent. You got to score fifteen percent on five polls. We don't know which those five, which polls they will be. We just know somewhere about somewhere in Septemberish, 
they're going to start asking these poll questions, these polls, and out of five of those polls, how people respond will determine the percentage points that Johnson's Johnson Weld scores. Mm -hmm. If they are at fifteen percent, we will be on the national debate. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in light of the Democratic National Committee of the the WikiLeaks showing the the partiality the um, that they treated the Sanders folks with, I think at, when you look at what's taking place with Donald Trump and his campaign again, I don't know Donald Trump, so I have nothing really to speak about him mm -hmm. personally, but. I I look at the nature of his campaign, the vitriol, the um, just the agitation and the incendiary language that most Americans are wanting a choice. And so when that polling company calls and they hear, you know, Trump Clinton or Trump Johnson Clinton or whatever, what they hear that name, Gary Johnson, they realize that they have a choice. And we're at 15 percent. Wow. Wow. That's huge. See, my, my other thought was that when, uh, when, when, when Sanders basically said, hey, look, I'm going to sort the, the Democratic Party, but at the same time, he went back to the independence. Because the could, largest could voting bloc. Could, you you could he run back? All of a sudden you know, I'm not going to speak to that, Bruce. I, I, I don't I, want to get into that, but no, I'm just but saying. What I want to say, Bruce, <laughs> is that notice you said independent. The yes. largest voting bloc right now, right. the long, largest party is the independent party. Okay, right. Okay. So, 50% of all people registering to vote right now are right. registering independent. Right. Where is their party representation? Right, right. They, they're not going to get it through Clinton. They're not going to get it through Trump. They will get it through Gary Johnson and Bill Weld. Okay, I tell you what, on that note, we're just going to go on and break it there, but with the understanding you will be back. Sir, a couple weeks. I have maybe? to. You were, you were a Viet, you were a Vietnam Marine. <laughs> oh, yeah, buddy. Trust I was me. a Navy corpsman. Yeah, so and I, and I, I'm Doc. You do understand what a gunnery is. Yeah, abso oh, right? absolutely. Okay, buddy. So you understand my deal. Jarhead and squid. Here there we you are. Go. Our sight. I love it. <laughs> Keep giving those checks in there too. I like that. Yeah. Gary, thanks very much. I'm sorry. Scott. Scott. Scott, thank you very absolutely, much. Absolutely, Bruce. Hey, folks. There you get it, folks. You got a third guy sitting up there, right there, waiting for that deal. September. Remember that September. But we're going to get him back When you hear that on. name, when that pollster calls you. Just put, say Gary Johnson, if nothing else, imagine what it would mean to have a third party voice on that debate stage. It would change the nature of the yes, discussion, yes, the nature of the content. Yes, it will. Thanks again. We'll be right back. Thanks again. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back, folks, to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host, and I'll tell you what, we're right into this campaign. Let's get right down, right down to business here. You know my guests. You've seen her. You've seen her in Oregon. You've seen her at, uh, at her various uh, appearances, appearances at, her own, at her own shows, if you will. She's on YouTube. I mean, she is the definer when it comes to race talk. She is the person. I tell you, she's been doing this business how long? No, we're no. in our sixth year sixth year wow the sixth year it's been awesome my last one and i've got the brochure you notice i'm just going right down to the meat of the matter here the last the last session that she had that i went to was let me see where am i donna there they are right there it was on july the 12th what does it mean to be white in america boy wow what an appropriate statement with the situation that we're having in the campaign now for for president of these united states and as I said uh, in the show when I, when I was with Scott, I said, we're basically having a rev revolution right now. It's a revolution when you think about the historical standpoint of this country. They had the revolution. That was the mother country aspect of it. Everybody got together with their differences and whatever. And then all of a sudden they got together. They worked together. And all of a sudden we had America. And then all of a sudden there were some changes. It was called race problems. Uh, president Lincoln ran for, for president, right? 
Lincoln ran for Lincoln ran for president of the United States, and then the uh, IE, and they basically said it was all because of black and the white aspect of it, the North and the South aspect of it, and they were actually having race talks then, where they had a sort of agreed. They broke away. So the next thing you know, uh, all of a sudden the man gets, uh, well, it was the United States and the Confederacy aspect of it. And all of a sudden, he, he's not with us anymore. And I think had he lived, we wouldn't be sitting up here talking right now. We'd be enjoying somewhere, in the, or some, or whatever. You know, but the bottom line is that we've got a problem. We've got an issue. So now we've got a, we got a major, major issue right now uh, here. We've got a presidential election. And this is kind of like right where we are again. We can either have another civil war or we can solve this problem and be Americans across the board. And that's why I've invited you because, in all due respect, you have been talking about these issues across the board for the last six years. Well, I mean, probably more if like not the more last than that. 65. 65. So. Fair. <laughs> I hope I've introduced you enough. Then you can explain. Your... You didn't tell him who I was. Oh, yes, I did. You I said say... Donna, Donna Maxey. No, you didn't. But, I don't know. but that's okay. Then it's okay. <laughs> they got you propped out. Okay, Donna, share us a little bit. Why did you put this race talk piece together? I'm a retired educator, okay. and at the time I was a teacher in Portland Public Schools. Uh, we were doing the program um, of Courageous Conversations about Race. And the whole idea was to start talking about race. And I saw some people who were, how you say, objectionable people mm -hmm. who got it. Mm -hmm. People who, who were not always kind to other people, but they understood, they were able to take another perspective and look at this and understand from another point of view that was not necessarily their own point of view about the issue. And I thought, this is great, except we need to have it in the public away from people's paychecks. Because if you connect it to people's paychecks, I'm going to say what you need me to say mm -hmm. because my paycheck is connected. Mm -hmm. Now, when it's out there and it's in the public and it's anonymous, then I'll be more real to my my true feelings about the issue. So um, I started it with um, with the help of Uniting to Understand Racism and McMinimins Kennedy School, and so we we started having these discussions. Uh, we've had some amazing topics. Um, like. We've talked about the first year was about race in Oregon, what it was like to be a per African American in Oregon, what it was like to be an Asian in Oregon, what it was like to be um, Latino in Oregon. We went through a number of different ethnic groups. Uh, we tied we tied all the Asian people together. My favorite line from that particular um, time was Polo Catalani said, "You know, we we weren't Asians before we came to this country. We didn't know we were Asian until we came here." Before we were Filipino, mm -hmm. Indian, mm -hmm. Thai, mm -hmm. Lao. Mm -hmm. They were from all different countries. They were not a homogenous group mm -hmm. of people and expected to have a monolithic point of view. Just as white people are not monolithic, nor are African Americans, nor are Latinos. Mm -hmm. So um, everyone has their own point of view and everyone has to be heard. And um, just as your previous guest talked about the Johnson Weld ticket, mm -hmm. there's also Trump's ticket mm -hmm. and also Clinton's Clinton, ticket. Yes, right. So there are different points of view. Mm -hmm. Now, all of those people are white, but yep. they don't all agree on everything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. clearly, they're not a monolith and mm -hmm. nor are communities of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just jump right up into it. I mean, we, we, they said we got this election on at this point in time. Now it's sort of like a black and white issue with the shootings and this, that, and the other. How, how do you respond to, to race, uh, some of the stuff that you've been doing to, to this era that we're dealing with right now? Because we got a heck of a, we got a, heck of a race here for, for president. And at the end of the day, it's going to be a... Race is the smoke screen. Yes, go on. Race okay. is the smoke screen. Race was the smoke screen when the Civil War occurred. Mm -hmm. Because the Civil War wasn't about black people. Right. The Civil War was about money. And it was about the South was going to lose their commanding lead in the, um, in the industrial world because they had free labor. The I thought they, they had cotton gins. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Northern states no were um, were upset and angry because right. they had to pay for their labor. Right. 
Um, and so there was an unfair advantage there. Your previous uh, guest spoke about um, a, a tax across the board, and that's really great if everybody pays taxes on every dollar that comes in in their name. Mm -hmm. But when you have taxes, when, when you, are, you have a company that purchases your car, then you don't have to pay for that. Poor people pay for every dollar. They are taxed on every dollar that they earn. People who are wealthy have different places to pay, place that money so it doesn't come directly in their name. It's all very interesting, and, and it's always been about money and power. Yeah, money and money. that's what it is about now, money and power. Racism, sexism, ableism, these are all ways to identify who are the people in power. And the people in power are always looking for ways to eliminate competition for goods and services. Mm -hmm. So you eliminate your competition for goods and services, and then those are the people who get to work together mm -hmm. to move forward. But let's be real, we don't want everybody to move forward. Mm -hmm. The most duped people in this country are white people. People of color understand that we are not, we are not written into the American dream. Who is duped is poor working class and middle class white people because they're the ones doing the heavy lifting for the for the ten the ninety the ten percent at the top, and especially for the one percent. They're the ones doing all the work. And if I'm holding you down with one hand, mm -hmm. I can't move forward. I can't swim forward with two hands. I can only swim forward with one hand. The wealthy are have no contact with people of color unless they're a, a wealthy person. So the people who are, who are, and I was talking to um, Dr. Preston Moore, Doc, Reverend Dr. Preston Moore. He is a, a, an attorney and a minister, yeah. and he did a presentation at Race Talks called Learning to Be White. And my question to him was, why do white people keep voting against their own best interests? And the answer was amazing they're voting their aspirations. Hmm. aspirations. They're, they're voting their aspirations. They're not voting for their reality. They're voting for what they aspire to be and the hope that someday they might be able to be up there and part of the 10%, part hmm. of the wealthy class. That's why people keep buying tickets for the, um, for the, the, the lottery. The lottery, the lottery. Yep. You know, they're voting yep. an aspiration yep. that they're hoping to get to be that someday, even though the odds are against them. And that money that they're putting into that lottery ticket might be better spent, you know, putting it into savings. Well, where does or the African American fit in that thing? If I were to ask you, how do they sense when they pick up that lottery ticket? We're, we're, we're voting our aspiration too. We want to be rich. Everybody, you know, Maslow said it, Abraham Maslow has his hierarchy of needs, and I think that that is, says it all. Everybody wants the same basic things. Mm. Now, what it looks like to you and to me might be two different things. I mean, maybe you eat, um, you know, I, I always say that every culture has, has some kind of unleavened bread. Mm -hmm. um, black people have hot water cornbread. Um, you have Jews have matzah, you have um, crepes. They're all unleavened, mm -hmm. and they all are basically made from the same ingredients, which is flour, water, salt, maybe a little sugar, and maybe an egg. But they're all basically made from the same thing, and but they don't look alike. Mm -hmm. So we all want the same things. Mm -hmm. We're all trying to just live, survive, have a family, take care of ourselves, have enough to eat, have a little leisure, um, be respected, mm -hmm. be respected and treat it fairly. Mm -hmm. Well, you may mention that when you first started, you said, well, the Civil War was about money. It wasn't about black and white. Right. It was about money. Is it about money today or is it about race? It's about money. It's about money. How it's about so? money. Well, uh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. If you have, in order to have a top, you have to have a bottom. Okay. And someone has to be on the bottom. And it's really, um, I was in a group of women who are all women of color from all different countries around the world. And one of the things that was brought up is that African Americans are seen to be very ignorant, very um, loud, 
aggressive, all, all these negative mm -hmm, mm -hmm. attributes. And these are, and the question is, and they come here acting like, you know, the people who come here, come here with that point of view. Well, where did they get that point of view? They got that point of view from movies, from videos. They've gotten that point of view from media. They have not met any people <laughs> themselves personally, but they come here with a point of view. And in this country, African Americans are just considered to be the bottom of the barrel. Hmm. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that you, you have to step outside of your comfort zone if what you want to know are the facts. You have to step outside of your comfort zone and get to know who is across from you and who mm. people are. Mm -hmm. And I always love to say when people have told me, particularly white people have told me, you're different than the rest of them. <laughs> and my answer, my question always is, how many of them do you know? <laughs> so, okay. you know, people are who they are. Mm -hmm. They're in every ethnic group, in every nationality. There are people who are positive. There are people who are negative. It just is one of those things that um, you have to get to know people. Okay. Now, do you think, and I'm just getting right into this piece here. Now, we've got the, we've got the president's elections, you know, and we've seen the conventions from the Republicans, the Democrats. We had, we had Hillary Clinton over here on the Democratic side. We had Donald Trump on the Republican side. Not enough on Gary, but he's getting there because I'm going to have him back on it, if you will. But do you feel that they're having that discussion that you just shared with me in regards to uh, what the problem is with that divide routine? Because you know we had these shootings, we had this, we had uh, Black Lives Matter, and this, that, and the other. Are they having that discussion? Do they understand? You think? Not really. Okay. I I think that the discussions we can. T there are many white people who are upset at the thought that Black Lives Matter, and the reason they're upset is because they want to know why do you have to say Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. In this country, it is understood that when you're talking about a man, that what you are talking about is a white man. Mm -hmm. If you are talking about a person of color, then you would say a black man or an Asian man or an mm -hmm. Indian man. You, you preface what that man is. But if you just say a man, it's understood that you're talking about a white person. So white people don't understand that they are taken into consideration always because they are the bottom line. They are the norm in this culture. And the discussions are happening. I, I think that people are being upset about Black Lives Matter because they don't understand how black lives have not mattered. There has been so much killing and lynching of African Americans in this country since beginning of time when we came here. and. They used to have lynchings on Sunday afternoons. If you know, you know, people didn't dress up. Mm -hmm. So if you look, go back. They have postcards that show lynchings. Everyone's dressed in their Sunday finest. So mm -hmm. this is Sunday Sunday entertainment mm -hmm. where they would come and lynch people, mm -hmm. where they would mutilate the body. They would hang the person. They would uh, take the body and break it. You know, put it, set it on fire. Mm -hmm. Take pieces and sell them. There are all kinds of, uh, there are so many horrible things that have happened to African Americans and poor people in this country mm -hmm. that the average person in this country, African Americans too, do not know about. Mm -hmm. It's something you have to look at. So I, I say that one of the best things that happened to black people in this country was the cell phone camera. Hmm. Because now it is being documented what has been going on for centuries in this country. But For Donna, centuries. But Donna, but check this out. But the number of people will say, well, we've had this black president, Obama, for the last eight years. Haven't we solved the problem? First of all, Obama is half white. Okay. And his father is African. And I, I will never forget, um, someone told me that the assumption about black people in this country is that your ancestors were slaves. Obama's ancestors in these people's minds were not slaves. They were, they were African. Yes, my ancestors were slave, but so were everybody else's in the world. At some point in time, everybody's been on the bottom of the barrel. Yes. So it is not one of those things where 
so he's African. He is African. African. And white. For many people, I, I had white friends who told me, why does he always say he's African? He's yes. black. Yes. And the answer is, white people came up with that rule. One drop of black blood and you're black. Hmm. We didn't come up with that rule. So we're just following along and he's going along with what has been laid out before him. In terms of, of him being president, the president has some power, but the president doesn't have all of the power. If he had all of the power, we would have induced Congress to vote for different things. We would have induced the Supreme Court, and God rest his soul, Scalia is gone. We would have induced him to have a different point of view. It's a checks and balances, and the president can only do so much. He does not have a tremendous amount of power. Congress is a major player and everything, the Supreme Court is a major player, just as the president. The pre president is more of a figurehead. And yes, he does have power, but he's the person out front, not with all the power. Um, I, I think that we have made a lot of change in this country, but there's still a lot more change to come. I thought it was quite interesting that um, Cain is now the vice presidential candidate, and he is a Jesuit. Now, I think it's interesting. That's they the Democratic side. That's, that's yes, the, the Democratic yeah. side. They mention he's a Jesuit. What they don't mention is that Jesuits are Catholic. And I remember when John Kennedy ran for president and what an anomaly that was mm -hmm. and how people weren't going to vote for him because he was Catholic. And I remember a former principal of mine telling me that there was a different be difference between Catholics and Protestants. They were two different religions. And I had to point out, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. They both believe in Jesus. They both, you know, pray to the same God. They both use the same book. They both believe that Mary is the mother of Jesus and all of these things. So how are these two different religions? They're two different sections or sects of a, of a religion, but they are, not, they are the same religion. And people get confused. We change the rhetoric to go along with our particular point of view. What we have to look at is what is best for all of us. Mm -hmm. There's always gonna be the alpha group. There's always gonna be <laughs> the zeta group, for lack of a better word. <laughs> yeah. And that's part of what it is. And times change. In another 500,000 years, white people might not be on the top in the United States. The United States might not be a country. We're, pretty, we're burning out pretty fast on this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I see people saying, God bless America and America is wonderful. I think the average American has no idea how much America has, the United States has been sold out. Mm -hmm. That foreign entities mm -hmm. own major portions of this country. Mm -hmm. Tell me this, we got about five minutes. Spend, let's spend a little and time I need on to talk to you about that too. Oregon, mm -hmm. yeah, right. Real quick, like, how do you, why do you feel, what, what do you feel Oregon? How about Oregon, where do we fit? In this whole issue. Oregon's a very interesting place. You've got the state you've got the state of Portland <laughs> and you have the rest of the state. Okay. And Portland has always been much more liberal than mm. the rest of the state. And so that's why Oregon is a blue state. If you took Portland and Multnomah County out of the voting, you would have a red state. Mm -hmm. Because the majority of the people in this State are very conservative. I remember as a child wondering why people who were in rural Oregon had southern accents. And it wasn't mm -hmm. until later that I found out that a, a majority of the people who are in rural Oregon mm -hmm. came from the mm -hmm. South. Wow. So it's Oregon, Portland's a very, um, and, I, and I think very honestly that Portland is more PC, politically correct. Right. Because I don't see people mixing in terms of friendships, in terms of relationships right. here in Portland. I wow. think a lot of people vote according to um, a philosophy as opposed to an actual lifestyle that they conduct. Well, folks, I want you to know we got about four minutes and I wanted to spend a little bit more time on House Bill 2016 and then I would refer you to her 
YouTube page. What's, what's your link? Was it just Race Talk, right? It's Race Talk. Race Talk. Okay, Donna Dorsch. Okay, now let's, so let's talk about So just go to YouTube and yeah. type in Race Talks. Just, just, just uh, in House Race Talk. Bill 2016 is a bill here in Oregon, uh, Oregon House Bill 2016, and it was written recently um, and funded by the legislature, and the whole idea is to improve, to decrease recidivism, which means the return to prison okay. of african-american black and biracial children okay and so multnomah education school district has been funded and race talks as a partner along with guiding light family services and savalti family services okay we're all partners with multnomah education school district coming up with a program and seeing what services we can provide wraparound services for elementary going into junior high, junior high going into high school, high school going into college. Mm. And we're working on trying to, it's a one-year program. We just got, the grant was just funded okay. in July. Okay. And it starts, start school. Well, will you keep us in a vetting mode kind of a deal? I will keep As time you, goes, come back and tell me where it is. And we, we're not going to be talking about two or three kids, right? No, we're talking about every African American, black, biracial child that comes through the, um, th and in MESD has a school which is Donald E. Long, okay, right. which is the Juvenile Delinquent right. Center. And so Donald E. Long um, is fed children from Yamhill, McBenville, um, a number of different counties all around okay. so the program involves children who are there and we'll be following those kids and tracking them to make sure that they are successful and we have um, advocates that will be each child will have their own advocate that will help the child the school the parent so that and the teachers and we're going to and we're actually going to start from k1 k12 are you just going to start no it's children who have come through the through. Donald Lee long center oh, which is the okay. juvenile delinquent okay Okay, I want to J make sure we used to be JDH for okay. the old timers. Okay, good. We got about a minute and a half. Any lasting thoughts? And then I want you to come back now. Remember, we got to be coming back on this piece. Okay. Well, I welcome people to come to Race Talks. I welcome people to get involved in action to put their money where their mouth is, mm -hmm. get involved. Yes. When, you know, I went to see Hands Up the other night. It's a play that was at uh, Artist Repertory Theater. It was seven playwright's version of what it's like to be black in America and how it feels. Good discussion afterwards. We need people to come away from events like Race Talk, from Hands Up, go out and join a group that are doing some action. Mm -hmm. The group might be the NAACP, it might be the Urban League, it might be Don't Shoot Portland, it might be uh, Black Lives Matter, it doesn't matter, it might be the Latino Connection, whoever it is, go and join and get involved. That sounds good. Maybe maybe even join the Oregon Voters Digest and come on the show. That's a possibility. Like yourself. Is that okay with you? That's a possibility. That, <laughs> that works. But again, let's re remind them again about your YouTube and how to access you. You got a phone number or anything that you want to share? You can go to YouTube and it's Race Talks, type in Race Talks and our events will come up. Uh, they, we, they've been televised for the last five years. And we have all different topics. This last one was what it means to be white in America. The next one coming up is uh, a panel of women of color talking about Jesse Williams' uh, uh, black education, black entertainment um, station speech. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don, it's always a pleasure. Always. Okay, folks, as you see, check them out, okay? I'll see you next week with another one. Take care. Have a good one.